I want to talk to you fighting men and women about the battle of the United States. You may wonder what I mean by this. You may wonder why what I'm about to tell you has not been told in detail before. The battle of the United States took place in every community in the nation. It was a struggle against enemy agents who had been sent to this country to disrupt our industries, destroy our morale, and damage the impact of our fighting armies. These agents were directed by the same high command that directs the German and Japanese armies in combat. Their ends were the same. Not until these enemy agents were brought under control could this information be made public. The Battle of the United States was a victory for us, and there is no one to whom I would rather give this information first than to you. Remember the United States in 1940? The lights were bright. The New York World's Fair was in its second year. The Brooklyn Dodgers had a good team. There was a bump of crop in the weak states. Soldiers in the new draft army were allowed to wear civilian clothes on weekend passes. There were a lot of automobiles, a lot of young men around, but beneath the familiar surface of American life, the beginnings of a bloody war against Germany and Japan were being fought. A short wave radio set beam for Germany was discovered in the Bronx. An American ship was torpedoed in the Caribbean. Letters addressed to mail drops in Spain and South America were intercepted. These letters contained military information. In a house outside Los Angeles, this self-appointed dictator set himself up in the business of promoting Nazism. And in Chicago, in New Jersey, and Long Island, this shameless abuse of the freedom of speech was taking place. Here in New York City, where the soldiers of the Second World War were still occupied peacefully as lawyers, barbers, husbands and fathers, these German paid agents were spreading their poison. Chicago Boon was a lieutenant in the German army and the leader of German sabotage in the United States. Our fingerprint files showed us that innocent appearing persons applying for work in United States war plants had been convicted of espionage in the last world war. Our charts showed us the location of every key spy and mail drop in North and South America. We knew that the Japanese consul in Pearl Harbor was sending military information to Tokyo. Peacetime laws made it impossible for us to arrest German and Japanese suspects. We could only wait for the day when this undercover war resulted in the open declaration of hostilities. For years before the war, the world had been overrun with German tourists, German and Japanese diplomats and their paid agents, disguised as cameramen, domestics and industrialists. We knew how successful their agents had been in Europe and Asia. It was our business to check their penetration 
into the Western Hemisphere, the occupation of South America by fascist forces would have been a grave threat to the security of the United States. The Western Hemisphere, as yet untouched by formal war, was already in the throes of an invasion. In this continent, German colonists had settled in Patagonia, and military installations there could close the Strait of Magellan and the Pacific Ocean. Enemy agents were using both coasts of South America as extended listening posts to inform the axis of our shipping in the Atlantic and the Pacific. More than 300,000 Japanese colonists had cut into the jungle a belt of strategic settlements reaching from the Brazilian coast into Peru and Ecuador. A network of German airlines beginning in Argentina had spread as far north as Colombia and Colombia air bases could dominate the Panama Canal. A neighboring and friendly continent could become an armed menace aimed directly at the United States. German and Japanese agents had watched South America covetously for years. They had become so confident of their ability to conquer that the German merchant fleet made no effort to conceal the fact that German agents were a large part of its cargo. The symbol of tyranny and war began to appear in the large South American cities and in the backwoods of Patagonia. Their grip on South America began with German and Japanese colonists settling near strategic rivers and potential landing fields. It began with small German-owned shops, automobile dealers, hotels, consulates, and reached into chemicals and heavy industry. Their attempts to poison the thinking of South Americans began with pictures of Hitler in a primitive schoolhouse in the interior and mushed room into a mass rally. Most South American airlines were dominated by German interests and staffed with German pilots. Well-planned industrial accidents slowed up production of material for the United States. Their plan for conquest had advanced until these reports were received by the FBI. Information received from ST-89 that Germany plans direct attack on Panama Canal with German and Jap planes and also move against ports and oil lines in Colombia. I have received a report from confidential source previously found reliable that Germany will build a fleet of 1,000 cargo submarines to carry expeditionary force and supplies to Colombia and Venezuela. That was the situation in South America. In close contact with Axis agents in South America were their colleagues in the United States. It was less than a month after Pearl Harbor that 33 of these international criminals were convicted in our courts as foreign agents. Their conviction was made certain by motion picture film taken by our agents with cameras concealed at their meeting place. Taking this film was dangerous work. Much of it is badly lighted and uneven. But I have this film here and I would like to show it to you. These pictures were taken at a busy New York street corner. The man walking up and down the street is Harry Sawyer, a naturalized German-American citizen. Sawyer visited Germany in 1939, where he was approached by the Gestapo who urged him to return to the United States as a spy. Before leaving Germany, he sent word to us. A spy trap was set. Sawyer was working for the FBI. Walking into this trap is Colonel Fritz Duquesne, a leader of the spy ring and a professional German spy who had made a business of stolen information since before the last war. 
The FBI established Sawyer in a downtown office building in New York City. A concealed camera in the next office took these incriminating pictures. That's Heinrich Klossing, a cook on the liner Argentina. Klossing's work was to act as courier, carrying military information. These spies had a radio station on Long Island, which, unknown to them, was operated by an FBI agent and information was falsified until it was worthless, saving the lives of thousands of American seamen, American tonnage, and American goods. The important looking man is Hartwood Kleiss, who worked for the United States line as a cook. The money Kleiss is given to Sawyer is for the purchase of a Leica camera to be used in his activities as a spy. In these pictures, Kleiss has brought to Sawyer the blueprints of the steamship America, showing the plans of a secret gun emplacements. There's Duquesne again, the leader of the ring, and the most cautious of them all. He is removing diagrams of the M1 rifle, an airborne tank, a PT boat, and a late model plane which he had concealed in his sock. He is describing to Sawyer the gas operating principles of the M1 rifle, a secret which might have made a difference in the lives of a lot of Americans had it reached Germany at that time. The last spy to walk into the trap was Takio Ezima of the Royal Japanese Navy, assigned in this country as a paymaster. All of these pictures were taken, you must remember, before Pearl Harbor. But to the enemy, the fighting in Asia and the fighting in France were already different fronts in a single war. They would stop at nothing. On May 26 and 28, 1942, two German submarines left the base at Lorient. One landing on Long Island, the second landed in Florida. Four saboteurs landed from each submarine. They were well equipped with high explosives. Among the equipment they carried with them were blocks of TNT, some of which were disguised to look like lumps of coal. These were to have been left in department stores, railroad stations, and other places in your hometowns to kill the women of your family while they were shopping, to breed panic and insecurity in this country. The submarine saboteurs were in jail two weeks after they landed. Six of the eight were executed after a military trial. The attack against all German and Japanese agents in this country was as vigorous and as victorious as the attacks you have made against the enemy. That is only part of the story. Some of it is still secret. But we have a report which up until now has been known only to the highest officials of our government. After the fall of France in 1940, Adolf Hitler told his staff the war would soon end in German-dominated Europe. But there was another country that remained to be punished for her crimes against Germany. The country Hitler spoke of punishing was the United States. You have destroyed the enemy's plans. We have guarded the secrets that have given the Army and Navy its striking force in the field. We of the FBI feel that we're a part of a team to make America a great and decent place in which to live. We're on that team, all of us, together.